2022, please come to order. This evening's meeting will be a hybrid planning and zoning meeting hosted in person at the Nathaniel B. Green Community Center, 32 Church Street, Guilford, Connecticut, Menumkatuck Room, second floor, as well as virtually by Zoom. During this meeting, our procedures will be as follows. One, when you first enter the Zoom meeting, you will be in a virtual waiting room until the meeting host admits you. Two, please be aware that your camera, if you have one, and your microphone will be muted by the meeting host when you enter the meeting. You can turn on your camera at any time so that you can be seen by the others when slash if you choose to. In order to run an efficient and orderly meeting in this virtual environment, unless stated otherwise by the meeting chairman during the meeting, the meeting host will keep everyone other than the commission members muted. You will still be able to hear everything said by the commission members, even if you are muted and or your camera is not on. There will be opportunity for public comment during public hearings, at which time public participants will be unmuted. Uh, three, the secretary will read the call of uh, the meeting as published according to the government and wants the executive order. Four, during the public hearing, the applicant will be invited to present the application, explain to the commission and others present what is being requested. The meeting host will share all related documents on the screen as needed. In addition, all applications and supporting materials for each application on the agenda are available through our public meeting calendar page of the town website, www.ci.gilford.ct.us, and also through a direct, direct link on the planning and zoning page. Five, comments of the town agencies will be read for each application if there are any. Uh, there will be clarifying questions from the commissioners. Six, there will then be an opportunity for clarifying questions from the audience. Please raise your hand from the Zoom platform and wait to be called on and unmuted. As this public hearing must be recorded, it is necessary for the speakers to identify themselves each time they speak by stating their name and address. Seven, after all clarifying questions are exhausted, those will, who wish to support the application may come forward, state their name and address for the record, and make a statement. Then those who oppose the application will come forward for a statement. The eight, the applicant will then have an opportunity to address any questions or concerns raised by the public or commissioners. Nine, once the public hearing is closed, the applicant is free to leave or remain for the balance of the public hearings and the regular meeting, during which the commission will try to reach a decision on each application. Each applicant will be notified in writing as to the decision of this commission and has a right to appeal to superior court if desired. Ten, Decisions of this meeting are available uh, the day after the meeting by calling the Planning and Zoning Department at 203-453-8039 or by emailing planning.zoning at ci.gilford.ct.us after 9 a.m. 11, all actions taken tonight by the commission will be by a roll call. All commissioners and staff will identify themselves for the record before speaking. Seated this evening on the following members who identify themselves. Um, I don't believe we have Kevin Clark, Bill Freeman. Bill Freeman. Uh, Ted Sands. Bill Johnson. Uh, Sean jumped on Sean Cosgrove. Uh, Frank DeAndre. President, accounted for. Uh, and Scott Evans Chair. Uh, also, Larry Rizzolo is your host. President. And Jason Marchi is our alternate. Today we'll, um, we'll have Jason Marchi be seated, please. Yep. Uh, because Kevin Clark is not here. Staff uh, President are Jamie Stein, Town Planner. Good evening. Uh, uh, Lisa Piamino, Planning and Zoning Administrative Assistant. And Peter Schultz, Videographer. Uh, this meeting will be recorded by the Zoom platform and made available on the town website for viewing. Um, we normally have the secretary read the legal notice, however, there is not legal notice tonight. Um, so, with that, I call to order. Um, our first item on the public hearings is David Lissio, 134 Trolley Road, Map 8. Motion to open. Sure, motion. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, David Lissio, 134 Trolley Road, Map 8, Lot 74, Zone R2, Postal Site Plan to add a second floor and patio off master bedroom. This is continued for 2022 meeting. Mr. Lissio. 
Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I'm Dave Lizio, 134 Trolley Road, and we're looking to put a second story on our home, flat roofed home, and a uh, patio outside the uh, master bedroom. We submitted the plans, documents, um, and all related information that they've asked for. I think they have everything up to date at this point. I'm pretty confident that uh, everything's in order. So it was just look. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a couple of memos from town staff that we can read into the record uh, for you. That suits you. Um, Phil Johnson, would you like to read Sonia Marino's letter to the record? Sure. Um, Uh, this is uh, to the Planning and Zoning Commission from Sonia Marino, RS, MPH, dated May 17, 134 Trolley Road, Map 8, Box 24. The B100A application for a non flow generated building addition at the above reference property is approved contingent on soil testing being done on the property. The Health Department, HD, has discussed this with the property owner. Testing will need to be scheduled before the building permit is approved. However, the soil condition will not affect the actual approval. Testing is needed because none exists for the file and it is an increase in living space. The application meets the requirements for 19-13-B100A. The proposed application does not reduce the potential repair area for an on-site subsurface sewage disposal system because it is not an increase in the footprint of the building. The building also maintains the separation distances that already exist. Please note the approval for this three-bedroom building. Please note the approval is for a three-bedroom building. The owner has worked with the health department to address keeping the building at three bedrooms by updating interior plans. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, and we have a letter from uh, Environmental Planner Kevin McGee. Uh, Sean Cox, you want to do that to read this for us? Yeah, sure. It's uh, dated May 16th uh, to the Gilbert Planning Commission <clears throat> from Kevin McGee, Environmental Planner, uh, regarding coastal area management review. Uh, David Lissio, 134 Valley Road, the Connecticut, Post 647, Accessor Map 8. Lot 74. Yeah, was proposing to install a second floor addition in a patio. Stormwater management system consists of roof water discharging via cheap flow. Property is located in the FEMA zone BE 12 and AE elevation 11 flood zone. The coastal resource policy is applicable. The property of coastal hazard area, beach, rocky shorefront, coastal waters, intertidal flats, and shellfish concentration areas. The town engineers, uh, <clears throat> learned the vision, knows that the proposed addition would require the applicant to bring the house into compliance with the town's flood regulations. We were required to bring the property to Clients may require a state excavation to elevate the house above the required flood, flood elevations. The additional work may have an impact on the adjacent coastal resources if the erosion and sedimentation control measures were not properly installed and maintained. No erosion, no erosion and sedimentation control measures are shown in the submitted plans. In order to make sure that the coastal resources are protected, I recommend the following condition of approval. Number one, any disturbed areas and soil stockpiles should be contained by salt fencing or hay bales. The town of the facility enforcement officer should be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to site construction. Soil erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established or suitable material is installed to the satisfaction of the zoning, of the zoning enforcement. Number two, the 
the site which should be inspected daily to make sure that all construction construction debris is properly, properly disposed of in a covered dumpster. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Mr. Alicia, do you have any um, Wait a minute, there's, uh, I'm sorry. there's some additions here. There's a number three. Uh, that might be on an updated. Uh, I, we, we only have one and two, but if, what is three? If, if you wouldn't mind reading, sorry, Scott. If you wouldn't mind reading it again. Well, I, I'm looking at the motion. If there's something else here about the sure. finished grade and all that kind of stuff. Yep, that's, uh, that was from Janice, I believe. Do you want to speak oh, to that? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, Jamie? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, happy first to. First, I want to. So, <laughs> Just, uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Alicia first if he's fine with these two uh, these two stipulations from the environmental plan. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was under the impression we're not doing anything to the to the footprint of the building, so really, there's there's no there's no soil that's going to be moved anywhere. I think, uh, but I mean, I, I get that you know we got a police area for debris and so forth, but there, there's nothing that's changing the footprint on the first floor. So there's really uh, there's no digging, no dirt, no silt fence. Understood. But I mean, uh, these conditions are on the you know they are in the event. Right. I understand. Of, yep. uh, I understand completely. Uh, Mr. Johnson. So Kevin's um, memo brings into question uh, that the building may be required to be raised. Um, is there any more? I mean, I, I feel like the, the applicant should have a fair chance to understand in advance if this is going to be a requirement or if this is just someone loading something out. I mean, it, part of the building is in a DE flood zone. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious, like, other than Kevin saying it may have to be, why, why can't we have a definitive answer on that? If you remember, there was a memo from Janice who also spoke to this issue from last week, uh, from our last meeting. Um, since then, um, I know that Jamie has had discussions with all, all different departments of the um, town planner's office. And Jamie, I wonder if you could speak to where we got to. Sure, yeah, happy to do that. Um, so we, uh, in... Uh, over the past, I guess, week, uh, the Lizios have provided supplemental information for both the building department as well as the engineering department. Um, it would be the engineering department that will work with the Lizios uh, if the commission should move to approve the coastal site plan application to ensure that he meets uh, floodplain compliance. Uh, the flood hazard mitigation permit is a separate permit uh, that is um, under the jurisdiction of the uh, engineering department. And so that permit uh, is in addition to the coastal site plan application, as well as any building permit would be in addition to the coastal site plan application. Um, in discussions on Tuesday, yesterday morning, uh, with all of the land use staff, uh, we made an agreement that uh, with Kevin's uh, assessment of the impact, potential impacts on coastal resources, uh, that there was really uh, no further consideration within the coastal site plan application uh, that uh, would be needed at this time. I hope that clears so, it up. So, Jamie, just to be clear, um, the, those listed by the other departments um, will supersede any approval that we might well, um, the the granting of a coastal site plan uh, application approval does not relieve or uh, eliminate the requirement for a flood hazard permit or a building permit. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, Mr. Sands. I I I, I realize I'm new, but. Uh, I, I'm concerned that uh, we might approve something that is not firmed up here. I mean, from the point 
point of view of the property owner, it seems to me that since this memo from uh, the environmental uh, department says that there may be a requirement to elevate the property, which means jack up the house, a very, very major construction undertaking. Um, it seems to me that, that we should have some uh, certainty here as to whether the property owner is going to run into that liability or not. Um, yes, Bill. Bill, Bill, Bill. Yes, Mr. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little confused only because I thought we kind of agreed last time that we were going to use the uh, actual appraised value that came through on the appraiser versus the assessed value on the land and town records, unless that's changed or I misunderstood it. Jamie? Okay. Uh, so I think I think if we could just um, take a moment and uh, consider that the uh, application did come uh, uh, to the town for both a coastal site plan as well as a building permit. Uh, typically, when the town uh, when we get a coastal site plan application, uh, we receive only that and we review uh, the proposal at a high level to understand what the potential uh, impacts to coastal resources are. Um, at this, with this particular application, I believe that the town engineer's memo uh, sort of reflected the work that she was doing, both advising on the coastal site plan application, but also reviewing the building permit. Part of the building permit process, so if we take, for example, uh, uh, two, two Vineyard Point, am I, the Glass House, which was recently before us for a revised uh, coastal site plan application. Um, you know, we, perhaps at some point when it was originally a renovation, we saw those numbers, but it's not uh, part of the coastal site plan application to see the appraised value versus the renovation value. Um, that is part of the flood hazard permit application and the building permit application. Jamie, can I ask a question? Is it fair to say that if they had to raise the house, there would be a substantially different coastal site plan profile than is what is currently presented? Uh, it is my understanding that that answer is no, and that is reflected in what Kevin uh, has put in his memo. So if, so if they had to excavate out right. and raise the house up, saying it's not any different than just putting the second floor on it. The, the, the determination is that through Kevin's language of, you know, his typical language of being the uh, erosion control and sanitation control measures as well as uh, the daily inspections that that covers the uh, possibility if that is if that's an eventuality correct and also uh, soil erosion and control measures would have to be on the site plan for a building permit right. uh, and prior to the thank you and prior to the um, the commencement of construction that would have to be approved by the zoning enforcement officer. Now, I, uh, I just have to say, it just this seems like a little bit, either it's current before the forest or something else. It, 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 I'm not sure it should come before us. Everything else, all the items have got the T's us with the other departments. For us to approve something, that has yet to go through other departments seems to be a little bit premature. This and I, I just want to be sure that Mr. Lizio is, is aware of the fact that if any part of the property is in a BD zone, it is very likely that the property will have to be raised to be stated. I, I've researched this immensely. I mean, I've read all of the CAM applications, the 174 ordinance. I mean, we've been, you know, uh, 
Janice has been, you know, requesting different documents that I've provided to her. So I understand what the liabilities are. And, you know, as far as I was told that this is just the first step in, in going forward that the application for the CAM application is not saying that I'm going to be able to do the house one way or the other. It's just a matter of saying that this one step is out of the picture and now the rest of it will go through the engineering and town planner and, and building department to make sure all the rest of the, the big picture works. So, I mean, that's... So the general state, it's a general statement that CAM applications of relatively small part. I'm just curious, right. as Sean said, that's correct. why are we out in front on this? Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's my that, that point. And, you know, my only question is, you know, Mr. Lizio, I just want to be sure that given you know, if, if a portion or all of your property is in a BD zone, it is likely that property will have to be raised. So well, that's, I, that, I mean, that's, that's not the way that the statute reads. It reads that 50% of the value is the uh, amount that you can do on construction. So, so if I decide to do just the first floor, I mean, that's what I may decide to do. I mean, I may decide not to do any of it. I, I mean, we just got to get past this one hurdle here. And then the building okay. department can do their part. Yeah, you know, Bill Freeman brought up, and, and, and I have reviewed, as other commissioners have, uh, the fact that you represent, I think, if I'm correct, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the structure itself on the property was assessed on land records at $94,000, and you're, you're representing that it is like $600,000? Am I incorrect about that? Two days ago, Jamie asked that I have, you know, I sent the appraisal to, I'm sorry, to uh, Janice, and uh, she asked that the uh, appraiser write a letter stating what the market value of the structure is and he did that and she you know she's the one who uh, is leading out front here on the on that appraisal so you know i just paid a million dollars for the property so i mean i think the the appraisal for ninety four thousand is basically just an old appraisal i mean right now the reality is that's you know the, there's an appraiser that appraised the property for a million i think it was a million one uh, I'm talking, uh, the, but, the, but the difference is between the appraisal of the property and the appraisal of the structure. Right, and uh, that's correct. And uh, so this, she, she had the appraiser to uh, draw, you know, dis distinguish between the property and the structure, as she asked, and he wrote a letter and signed it and sent it to her. Jamie, have, have, has the town looked into an independent appraisal on this issue? Uh, no, we would consider the third party that uh, Mr. Lizio found to, to satisfy that. Um, well, if, if, if um, there were questions with respect to that, what would be the next step? I mean, I, I only say this from the standpoint that um, in the past we've had experience where um, applicants have found appraisers to meet their needs. Um, as opposed to being an actual independent third party. Um, and I'm not saying that's the case or not. I'm just saying that you know, with respect to due diligence, you know, this might be a case where we should look into an independent third party. I, I, I would tend to agree. I mean, you know, to have an independent appraisal by someone of self-interest is value. And no interest. No, I'm saying, you know, we would have, no, an appraisal that, an appraisal that we would potentially contract would have no interest in its value. I'm saying that the current owner, um, you know, who recently bought it, has a very great direct interest in having an appraisal that is six times the value of the assessed value by on the town records. I didn't hire the appraiser. I don't know if you I didn't hire him. The bank did. So I think the bank uh, is looking for. You know what I mean? It was the third party was a bank appraisal. It was done for its mortgage. 
Right. So I think it's pretty hands off in that respect. Yeah. I mean, um, I had no say in the appraiser. Who it was, what yeah, they did, what they came up with. For that, for him to be involved with the appraiser. Exactly. Okay, so since our next steps here are either to uh, close the public hearing on this or is he listens to the rest of the public has to say or, or continue this to another meeting. Um, I want to take your temperature. It sounds like I've, we've heard a lot from um, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Sands, and Mr. Cosgrove. Mr. Freeman, do you have any opinion on if we should continue to move forward until this is resolved further? Or do you feel like uh, procedurally um, we can deliberate on a CAM application on its merits? I think we should deliberate on the CAM application. I think that he could, uh, the appraisal that he got is, as he said before, and he said tonight, is from a bank. So I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, I'm not 100% of, in, in, I don't have quite an understanding of the mechanisms here, how we're doing this before that, but I assume it's all been yeah. sourced out in town, and I'm comfortable with what uh, Jamie's come up with. Uh, Frank, can I hear from you, please? Yeah, I, I would agree with Bill at this point. Um, like I said, the appraiser can't be hung up on that because a bank hired it independently and it's illegal for him to be involved as a property owner with the appraiser. <laughs> so I'm okay to, to deliberate. Jason? Yes, I agree with the first two with Frank and with Bill. And, I, and now this is a continuum from last time. Correct. Yeah, because I looked into some on that, so I, yeah, I'm comfortable at this point. The little bit. Uh, Larry, you're not going to be voting tonight, but do you have an opinion on this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm uh, a little confused about uh, being the, uh, the relationship of the appraisal and the need to elevate the house. Sure. And, and uh, maybe someone can clarify that for me. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Johnson. So, um, if a property is located within a flood zone, whether it be AE, VE, or whatever, so VE is the most intensive flood zone. Uh, if you spend more than 50% of the value of the structure, so you dis you, you take away the value of the land, um, then you need to bring it into FEMA compliance with respect to flood. So, in many cases, that would mean help. So, you, if, if you've driven down Seaside, uh, Seaside Ave, you've seen houses that have been elevated. Yes. Um, that that's a direct result of people, you know, taking their living space out of a flood zone. Mm -hmm. And basically, the National Flood Insurance Program well, doesn't want people building in high hazard areas and have. have, have you know, implemented these, you know, regulations to, to restrict construction in flood zones or to create very high standards for such. Um, and the, the point of that is obviously they don't want to pay the claims because, you know, eventually, collectively, we're all paying the claims. Right. So, so I, I think I'm, I'm pretty clear on that point. The thing I'm understanding is that if the construction is below a certain value, um, it's not considered major enough. Um, it doesn't pass that 50% question. It doesn't pass that So they call it, 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 so, so so not, I, and it is a significant improvement. I see. So uh, given that, and uh, uh, given that this has been considered before, uh, uh, it, it seems y'all can go ahead. Jane Jamie's thought about this thoroughly, and, uh, uh, and the people that, that report her have thought about this thoroughly. And they're willing to go through. I notice in the letter the two uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, did not have anything to say about, as a condition, you must raise the house. So I think we can move forward. Um, great. Uh, any other questions from commissioners related to this application? Um, any questions from the public for really, this application? Uh, okay, would anyone want to speak in favor of this application? Again, if you are on Zoom, I can see you unless you unmute yourself or use your hand. Um, and then last.
say what I don't want to speak against this application. Uh, Mr. Lucio, any, any final comments that you'd like to make? Well, just that, you know, the house is almost above the floodplain as it is, sits right now. I, I, uh, we have one small crawl space that is under the flood zone, but everything else in the house is above the floodplain. So the house is in a, it's in a really good spot. I mean, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Um, I'd entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing on this issue. Oh. Second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Okay. This is just to close the hearing, correct? Right. Uh, Bill Freeman? Yes. Uh, Ted Sands? Yes. Bill Johnson? Yes. Sean Cosgrove? Aye. Frank T. Andrea? Aye. Uh, Jason Marshy? Yes. And I will, yes. Um, that is the end of our uh, public hearing, we'll open our regular hearing, and we'll move straight to this deliberation of this item. Um, we have a potential motion. Would someone like to read the motion of this application? Yes, Mr. Sands. I'll read it. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so now. Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a coastal site plan for David Lissio, 134 Trolley Road, map 8, lot 74, zone R2, addition of a second floor and patio off the master bed. The approved plans are addition and alteration for David Lissio, 134 Trolley Road, Guilford, Connecticut. Architectural drawing dated 4-26-2002, seven sheets. Uh, topographical survey plan of David Lissio, 134 Trolley Road, Guilford, Connecticut, prepared by Giuliano Associates, LLC, dated 1-24-2022. Zoning Location Survey by David Olicio, 134 Trolley Road, Guilford, Connecticut, Site Plan 1, Sheet Dated 3-28-2022. The applicant is approved with the following conditions. One, the Town and Guilford Zoning and Enforcement Officer shall be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to the site work. Any disturbed areas and soil stockpiles should be contained by silt fencing and or hay bales per the approved plan. Soil erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established or suitable material is installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. Two, the site shall be inspected daily to ensure that all construction and debris has been properly disposed of in a covered dumpster. Three, average finished grade must be calculated for reconstruction and detailed in the building permit application. Architectural drawings submitted for the application do not include a calculation of the average finished grade, which is used to calculate the average building height and maximum building height. Zoning compliance at the time of building permit application regarding the height of the building cannot be determined until average height and maximum height are calculated and shown on the architectural plans. Four, the application will work, applicant will work with the town engineer to ensure floodplain compliance, a flood hazard permit certifying finished floor elevations shall accompany application for building permits. Five, the applicant will work with the health department to complete soil testing on the site prior to the application of, for a building permit. Six, the final as-built survey be submitted for all post structures, including height of structures and other improvements as specified in the certificate of occupancy approval by the zoning 
enforcement officer, this application is approved based on finding that it does not have an impact on coastal resources. And the development is in accordance with the town's coastal area management regulations. The coastal site plan is effective on June 3, 2022, and upon filing with the town clerk. Thank you, sir. Um, is there a second? assurance. Uh, I do have a section of our zoning code, uh, which I did um, pull up here. Let me just, I think the audience can see it, but you all can't see it. So let me just share my screen. Um, sure. <laughs> so, um, so perhaps the language I would agree with you is, um, uh, loose uh, and, and up for interpretation. Um, and I, I do also uh, value uh, the record that is clear and defined so that staff can follow up, uh, you know, 10 years after a, <laughs> a permit has been issued. Um, so uh, just to be... Sure, sure. So this is, this is uh, a discussion of the flood plain district so uh, the floodplain. Thank you. The floodplain district consists of the special flood hazard areas, namely Zone A, Zone AE, and Zone VE. And then further down here, it says permit required. Within the floodplain district, no building or other structure shall be constructed, moved, or substantially improved unless a flood hazard area permit 
uh, therefore is obtained from the town engineer in accordance with chapter 174 flood damage pre pre prevention. So um, the, the uh, typical process is that a coastal site plan application is applied for through the Planning and Zoning Commission. It is approved or denied. Uh, the applicant then moves on to gain their flood hazard uh, permit as well as their building permit. So uh, this language here, I'm happy to include that uh, in the motion if that uh, is helpful for uh, achieving uh, wording that is less uh, ambiguous. Uh, the, the, and section P goes on to say that for the purpose of this requirement, substantial improvement means in repair, reconstruction, or permanent of the building, the cost of which equals or exceeds 50% of the market value of the building. Does this say the land? Does it say the, the whole lot? That's what I provided. That's what I provided two days ago. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's pretty clear. Um, I think if you wanted to just change it to we'll work with to uh, something else, I think what Phil said, I can't remember, but a little bit more definitive. Well, the same permit that affects yeah. the permit that's described. And so. Sure. Well, let me ask you, can I ask a question? And I think either uh, Phil might know this better than I or Jamie. The f so it says we'll work with the town engineer to ensure floodplain compliance. Floodplain compliance is pretty straightforward, right? There's not a lot of ambiguity in that. So that's the first one. And then the second one, the outcome with the health department complete soil testing. Well, soil testing is soil testing. It's done by, by a professional as well. So where is there room for ambiguity or... Oh, I mean, so can we change work to engage? Uh, I mean, if, they, if you hire five different appraisers, you're probably going to get five different valuations, or at least they're, they're not going to all be a down. But his valuation has already been established through his appraisal that he got from the bank when he bought the property, which was independent from his influence. So I think that he's already provided that with it to uh, Janice and Jamie and, and, the, and the rest. I think. Anything we just want to make it a little clearer that instead of saying we'll work, we'll engage, or something like that. Look, Phil, I don't disagree with you that we typically are not trying to do like approve a special permit, for instance, without having every every I dotted and T crossed and whatnot. It's more of it's you know from the staff is Wait, what, what, so this what, is part of the process. Once we say yes, we we will never see it. Correct. It will just become part of the machine. Well, it would come, again, the onus will be back on the town staff that it typically would be. Okay. But I think if I'm understanding Jamie correctly, we're doing it in the proper order, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so I mean, what are we what are we doing that isn't proper here? I think we just have to kind of follow the, the, the rules that are set forth for us and go from there. Well, from my perspective, and admittedly I'm very new here, but from my perspective, if we have an appraisal that is a bona fide third party appraisal, which I think a bank appraisal is, that says that the construction that he has requested is less than 50% of the value of the structure, that it is not a substantial improvement and therefore does not necessitate the, that he come into compliance. And it, to me, it would be a lot clearer if that opinion could be issued by whoever issues that opinion. So that when we approve it, it's the final step. I, I you know, one of the, I, I spent eight years on the economic development and one of the complaints that I was tired of hearing from developers is that there are so many different people you've got to go get approval from that just getting planning and zoning doesn't 
that just starts the process, and then you've got to go and deal with all these people in town hall south. And I think that the developers are exaggerating this, but it 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 seems to me that we should get this, in, in, you know, it should, these loose ends should be tied up before we approve. Um, Jimmy, as far as moving forward, I mean, I, do you have any idea of when this is going to be resolved between uh, Mr. Lesio and Janice? Well, right. So, I mean, I think uh, I would advise the commission to think of how in the coastal site plan application, we do not require a valuation or an appraisal of the structure. Uh, that is typically something that, that is something that is done when floodplain compliance through the engineering department is being assessed. So typically uh, what we receive is a coastal site plan application and that gets reviewed and approved and then the applicant will move forward with a building permit application and that will uh, get a, a demarcation on it that says, if this is in the floodplain, it needs a flood hazard mitigation permit. So the step process here is coastal site plan application, which then moves on to flood hazard mitigation permit and building permit. Um, so, you know, really at this point in time, the, the Connecticut Coastal Management Act, which requires the coastal site plan application and which is detailed in our own zoning regulations, looks at impacts on coastal resources. Uh, and um, all the other permits uh, will take care of uh, issues that are being raised. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Jamie. Uh, Mr. Sands, do you feel like you want to make changes to the session four and five in terms of the wording it will work? No, I, I don't think this is a question of wording. I, I think this is a question of uh, procedures going forward. I think if the property owner in this case is prepared to uh, follow the pattern that that Jamie has just outlined, then I'm happy to go ahead and, and, and approve this. But I think that going forward, it would be more, uh, it would be more fair to the property owners if we could present a, a, a very clear path for I agree. Certainly, this would not take nearly as much time as what's been spent on it to this point. Um, any other points or questions related to this vote? Um, all right. Well, I will move forward with putting a roll call vote. Um, Bill Freeman? Yes. Uh, Ted Sands? Yes. Philip Johnson? No. Uh, Sean Cosgrove. Oh. Uh, Frank DeAndre. Yes. Jason Marshy. Yes. And I uh, will, yes. Um, thank you. We'll move on to deliberations related to uh, Harvard Road LLC, Harvard Road, Map 79, uh, Lost Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Sharon, sorry, just for the record, can you? Uh, sure. Notify if the motion carries or does not carry. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Harvard Road LLC, Harvard Road, Map 79, Lot 48, Zone I 2, uh, mm -hmm. resubdivided in two lots, as well as the uh, site plan approval for construction of a CG SA 30G affordable housing project, including two buildings, parking area. Um, septic systems, utilities, and stormwater management. Jamie, do you want to um, uh, lay down the uh, general premise for what we're discussing? Sure, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think we'd like to take the opportunity now to uh, discuss in, in our deliberations uh, the Hubbard Road application. Um, you know, just uh, 
any any uh, discussion that the commissioners would like to have with each other regarding the application. I would also ask that we consider um, the uh, in the wetlands and watercourses commission. Um, uh, favorable referral and some of the conditions that are within uh, uh, that. So however you'd like to proceed. And uh, Attorney Andrus and I are here to, uh, you know, take notes. Sure. Uh, I, I think the first thing I would say, I, don't, I didn't have any problem with any of the conditions that were set forth that you just mentioned, um, having read through them, and those were also read to the record uh, for all to hear. Um, I think uh, one of the other questions that came out of the two public hearing meetings was the question about sidewalks, um, which was thoroughly discussed. Um, Jamie, it sounds like you had a discussion with Attorney Bloom since that meeting. Um, would you like to fill us in on that? Sure, yes. Uh, after the meeting, uh, I was reached out to by uh, members of the Safe Streets Task Force uh, that were hoping that uh, the development team could work with the town and specifically the town engineer's office to arrive at uh, perhaps a compromise or something that is amenable to all parties. Um, I did uh, raise this with the town engineer and she was also open to that discussion and I did raise this with attorney Bloom who was open to that discussion. Um, and. I'll um, leave it at that. Jamie, the sure. basement, is the developer um, stalling or just, are they open to considering um, defraying the expense or, or you know, absorbing the expense of a sidewalk? Right. Um, I don't believe that it's a stall. I believe that um, Attorney Bloom uh, expressed a concern for the portion of the sidewalk that is on the north end of Hubbard Road uh, as it crosses the West River Bridge. Uh, and there was perhaps a safety uh, concern uh, in a sidewalk that uh, is, um, I don't want to misuse any words here, but, but isolated. For those of you, the, the sidewalk is on the north side of the bridge that crosses the river. Correct. Um, and so we're talking about a sidewalk on the south side of the road, which would abut the property on the road. Did I get that right, Jimmy? Yes. So, yes, there was sort of discussion of, um, you know, a portion of the frontage of the Hubbard Road development on the north side could contain uh, elements of a crosswalk or elements of uh, a ramp up to, for a handicap uh, or wheelchair access to a sidewalk and a portion of the sidewalk. So I think it's really uh, just a desire to have a uh, nuanced conversation about connectivities between the north side where the sidewalk is and the uh, existing frontage or the frontage of the development. Well, you know, I'm hoping that engineering is being engaged on this, and that maybe they can remove the sidewalk from the north side, you know, consider a sidewalk from the south side to allow for a continuous sidewalk, you know, up our road that would go in front of this in the crowd. Yeah, uh, Sean, I think the, the, what we're looking to bring up here is what kind of wording we want to put in. It seems like everyone's interested in, um, the applicant speaking to or engaging with the engineer um, as well as the Safe Street Tax Force to find um, some common ground on the issue. And so the question is, what will we, if we were to do an approval, what um, what contingency would we put in, and how would that be worded to confirm that we would like them to to do that uh, to have that conversation? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if, if, Chuck, if you can speak up in terms of, I mean, I don't think we can require uh, anything as, as far as sidewalks go. Um, can we make it, can we make it interpretation? Approval? That's what I'm saying, what? Like that we, that they are forced to do sidewalks? Yeah. Can we, uh, can we require that? Chuck, do you want to speak on that, please? Sure. 
Uh, this is an application under 830G, so if there is a denial or conditions that uh, the developer believes affects the affordability of the project and takes an appeal, then the commission would have the burden of proof to establish that these, this condition is necessary to protect substantial interests in public health and safety, that those interests clearly outweigh the need for affordable housing and that they cannot be addressed by reasonable conditions. Yeah, so, That's, I'm sure. so, so let me let me argue the other side of that is, you know, if you've got kids waiting for a school bus, um, are you better off waiting on a sidewalk in front of your building um, or crossing, okay, I mean, there's no sidewalk on this side of the street. So my argument would be you're, you're better off waiting on a sidewalk um, and you're probably safer on a sidewalk than, than just sitting on the side of the road. But, 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 but Chuck, you're, you're basically saying that we're in a body of I, I, I'm just saying that you have that, that would be if they take an appeal, if they show that this uh, you know, affects the affordability, then the commission has that burden of proof, whether you can beat that burden of proof or not. I'm not sure. I mean, you would say this is, I understand the argument is that this is a matter of public safety and, and so forth. So, so that, I, that's, you know, a lot of things go into the equation. You know, would, would there have to be an appeal? Would have to, that, that would be the burden of proof. That's, we're just deciding what the statute is, whether we win or not. Do you know what the, what the cost for this sidewalk is? You ask me for me? Yes, thirty thousand. It's thirty thousand. Yeah, we we all we kind of estimated that uh, over the last couple of meetings that it was around thirty k. Doesn't doesn't a contractor normally have a contingency built in the developer? Mr. Sands, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I, I I've been following this uh, for you know, although I was on the commission, I I, I looked at all of the previous uh, meetings. And Relating to Hubbard, and I, I guess I'm with the Commissioner Cosgrove. I don't understand why the town persists in wanting to put the sidewalk on the north side when this, when the major property with population and people who would use the sidewalk is on the south side of Hubbard. Uh, part, part of the reason is that the bridge that was built between like where the Guilford Veterinary Hospital is and where uh, the safety zone is, the sidewalk was constructed on the north side. So there's already a pre-constructed sidewalk on the north side of the bridge and there's no sidewalk on the south it's, side of the bridge. And it's integrated as part of the bridge. So to, to actually flip that, I, I, I don't, I'm not an engineer. I don't know, but I think that would be um, expensive and problematic. Is there a sidewalk that goes from the bridge over to Church Street? We know from uh, from uh, testimony from the Safe Streets Task Force that that is part of their long-term plan. Um, the, the What's currently under construction on Church Street goes all the way to Harvard Road. Um, I don't know enough of the plan to know whether they're, they're I know that they're crossing the street uh, across Church Street to Harbor Road. I just don't know off the top of my head if it's the north side or the south side. All right, but, but I guess my question is, unless, I mean, this, this once again is a question of having everything tied up before we, we decide on approval. It, it, if the town is willing if the sidewalk has to go on the north side of the street because of this bridge, okay, then at a minimum, it seems to me, if we're trying to be fair to all the parties, we should say that the town has to commit within a certain period of time That's not to, build, right. to build the sidewalk on the north side of Hubbard to the bridge, and then the, the developer has to divide, has to build the sidewalk on the south side of the bridge on their property, and 
then the question is, how are people going to get across, which uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson correctly pointed out, how are people going to get from the south to the north side if they have school children to load them on the bus or, you know, how is that crossing going to be affected? And who's going to pay for the, for the, for the yeah. you know, whatever? I, I, think, I think safe streets, you know, would have preferred if they had had any say in this, but they were, they were reformed two or three years ago. If they had any say in this, they would have put the sidewalk on the south side of that bridge. Yeah, because their, their vision is to have a sidewalk all the way down Cumberland Road that runs down Longville Road, probably on the east side of Longville Road that connects with Route 1, and ultimately collect, connects all the way down Route 1, heading east. You know, so there, there's a really significant loop and, and um, you know, a walking path. Um, so, Sh Sean and Ted, your comments bring me back to, to kind of the original setup that I presented here. Of, this is uh, from, from Jamie's conversation with Attorney Bloom. That's the kind of conversation that the applicant is looking to have with the town staff, with the engineer, um, to kind of find out what the town's plan is. Um, and perhaps if they're creating uh, like proper ADA um, on either side of their entrance, so that then a crosswalk could later be added to that uh, upper ADA ramp, if that's, but it sounds like they, they're feeling, that's the, the feeling I'm getting is that they want to have, they want the town to have a plan, um, and then they, it seems like they're willing to do something. Um, so, but why, why, why are we requiring them to put the sidewalk in? Yeah. If the town hasn't committed to putting the sidewalk, if, you know, if we have one bite at the apple, we have one opportunity to to impose a condition of approval. If you come to them later and that buildings develop and they're out of the equation, who are you going to talk to? But, 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 uh, so, I made the point, and I think we have to consider that unless we want to engage in uh, either potential or likely litigation. But, but let me throw that out. Do you, do you think they're going to litigate this entire project over a $30,000 expense? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, know. I don't know either, but uh, you know, uh -huh. given the scope of this project, I don't believe that they would, but I, I'm not an attorney. No, but I'm, I'm trying to be fair to all the parties. It seems to me that, I mean, we have the authority to require them to put the sidewalk in on their property. But it seems to be unfair for us to impose that if the town won't commit to putting the sidewalk from Church Street over to their sidewalk, over to the bridge. That's a fair point, Mr. Freeman. I have a question that maybe Jamie can answer. Um, I don't believe that we have, uh, that we're required or are able to require them to do something that they're not required within our regulations. And I find it disconcerting for me to say that we do have that authority. Uh, why are we able to impose things that are part of our regulations? If we want to have it where someone puts sidewalks on the street when they come before the commission, then we should have it in our regulations. But to just say that we can ask applicants to do things because we would like it without having any, as Ted points out, without having any backup from the town as to what they're going to do, I think it's imposing a, a financial burden on the applicant that we're not, it's not within our wheelhouse. All right. Now, I, I'd love them to be you know, more community-minded and just recognize the fact that we've got a long-term strategic plan. Um, but I would like to avoid any possible litigation. You know, Chuck points out the 83 g you know, it's pretty, pretty plain, according to Chuck, that you know, you know any requirement of the town affects the ability, which this would even marginally. Um, you know, maybe the town should just, you know, cough it up and just say, we're gonna, if that's part of our strategic, strategic plan that it's going to increase, in, you know, 
increase the livability of downtown and the larger environs around downtown, then the, the town coughs up the money and does it itself. Um, Chuck, could you, I don't think you quite answered the question, so do you think you could answer Mr. Freeman's question, is there a place that we can require some amount of sidewalks even if we're not requesting the entire Sure, I'm going to defer to Jamie. Jamie, isn't there something sure. in the subdivision regulations that, that authorizes if this were a normal subdivision and the commission would require sidewalks or what, where? I thought you looked at that. I did look at that. Uh, thank you. It is uh, a section in our subdivision code which has, which lists out, which lists out the conditions by which the commission can require uh, frontage, uh, sidewalk on the frontage of a subdivision. Uh, that is, you know, within 100 feet of a public facility, that there are sidewalks uh, on that side of the road. There's a couple of other conditions. If you remember, I did pull it up in the last meeting, um, and uh, it is the develop developer's interpretation and, and mine uh, as well uh, that uh, those conditions are not met with this application. However, just to be clear, because this did come up, in our site, plan standards in our uh, zoning regulations concerning site plan standards there is a requirement that the developer make provisions for sidewalks on the frontage of their property so at times okay. oh, sorry. sorry quick question sure. so if it's within 100 feet of a public facility yep so oh. what's across the street oh there's a there's a bus depot across the street and I'm, I'm happy to pull up that section of the subdivision if you just. Uh... For the town of Gilford? Correct. This is the school bus depot. Okay, so that's, that, is that considered a public facility? I mean, it's owned by the town, I'm assuming, or leased by the town. It's owned by the town, it, it is uh, leased to the bus company. Okay, so. Throw that out there as at least. And I think that just to go back to the pictures that were shown on the last one, that the sidewalk is on the north side and that there are guardrails running probably 60 feet to the north, I think, if I'm thinking of it correctly. So I don't think that having sidewalks on the south side of the street in front of that property makes sense just from a structural standpoint, because there's a sidewalk on the other side of the street that's put there for a reason to be used. So why are we going to put a sidewalk on the other side of the street and then have to put a crosswalk in to get people on the other side of the street? Why wouldn't they go up to the next intersection and put a crosswalk to the shop? Sean said that it was going to go over to um, the street. He said that. Long, 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 long. Thank you. So, I mean, you know, I think we are, you know, we, I don't think it makes sense to what we're asking this person to do, personally. Uh, uh, just can we see if, Frank, did you have any comments about whether you thought there was any amount of sidewalks that would be, that we should require? Uh, no, I just, I always want to make sure that we're not requiring erroneous sidewalks. Um, I can think back to an application that was approved not too long ago where they require the developer to put in sidewalks that are going to go to nowhere. There's nothing on the left, nothing on the right. He's required to put them in, and the elevation is so great on either side of those that they're going to nowhere. So I'm all for if it's safe and it makes sense, um, you know, you should do it. I think what they have on there is pretty adequate, but that would be my only um, concern. I do want to speak up, and you know, this is not towards you, Frank, but just in general about the, the, the term sidewalks and nowhere. It is part of, you know, part of, as, as long as that road is within the plan of the Safe Streets Task Force in order to eventually complete those sidewalks, it's part of the town plan then to have each individual property as it comes up for a new, uh, new uh, application to potentially add sidewalks and over time those holes and those sidewalks and nowhere become lengths of sidewalks. Um, which, I, which I agree, but most you can of the time, debate, you no. can, Certainly you can debate about whether it's the responsibility of the town or the responsibility of the developer. That's a, that's a debate that can be had. Um, but I, I try to shy away from that term, personally. Well, yeah, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask the following question. Uh, could we approve this in a form that says, that if the town builds a sidewalk from Church Street to the bridge, the, de 
developer, and maybe they have to put up an escrow for this, uh, the developer uh, agrees to put the sidewalk on the south side of their property. Yeah, I, I don't think we can put... I don't think you can uh, to to put a financial commitment on someone to do something on... I mean, if you're talking about keeping the sidewalk on the north side or the south side, like either, I don't think we could, I don't think we can condition approval on them paying for a, a sidewalk on the north side of the, that's not on their property. I think that's probably not possible. So is the, uh, can I ask a question for Jamie? If I'm sure. You, Jamie, you, you probably looked at the plans recently, I can imagine, the site plan. Yes. Uh, you, I can't recall if the sidewalks in the site actually go up to the street or that they just end in the parking lot area. Maybe we could just have them, if you could answer that, that would be helpful. Right, yeah. Um, I don't remember that detail specifically, but I can pull it up. Uh, perhaps while I'm doing so, um, if I could just throw out a thought to help you continue your deliberations. Uh, this notion of creating sidewalk provisions which are connected to the town's long-term plan for sidewalks on Hubbard Road, if that might get you thinking um, in, in, a, in a certain direction. But I'll, I'll try to pull up the site plan now. Um, I think sort of the kind of there was to put some kind of, you know, handicap ramp that comes down to the street at the intersection, maybe a pad there that people could stand on, maybe for the bus, that kind of thing. And then if the town ever brings the sidewalks up the north side and continue to use on, then there could be some sort of provision for, you know, striped crosswalk or something like that. Thanks, thanks, Bill. That's also what I was about to bring up as well. So, yeah, what does the commission think about that kind of an idea um, of just them completing basically the end of their sidewalks that come up towards Hubbard Road um, with something that's ADA, that's, that's handicapped and an acceptable um, corner to on both sides of their drive. Better than, better than nothing. Right? Yeah, I mean, and so, Chuck, we did that. Is Chuck still there? Yes. Uh, Chuck, if we did that with that um, would that directly relate to 80, uh, 832? Uh, <laughs> if, if they found that condition to be onerous and they wanted to take an appeal, then the commission would have the burden showing it was needed for health and safety that outweigh the need for four blocks. But I'm okay. not against in that statement. Okay, all right. And so as, as, as uh, you know, Phil pointed out, it, it, you know, that, that would seem to be to be a a bridge, no pun intended, to um, you know maybe put something forward that would be more palatable to the developer, not as unpalatable as you know thirty thousand dollars, but just you know it would it would be, might might mitigate their desire to appeal. Mitigate their appeal would cost more than the cost of the sidewalk. Or yeah, even just the, the the compliant areas for for kids and yeah, ADA people right. being able to wait for transportation. Right, it does satisfy some of the safety concerns that that Fletch brought up earlier. I do have um, to say that. Like you meant something. Sorry. Um, I, I wasn't sure if I'm allowed to participate in this part of the discussion, but I, if you're an alternate, if you're not seated, you should not. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Sorry about that, Larry. Yeah, uh, no worries. Jason, did you have anything you want to bring up? Yeah, I'm just, uh, what did, Sean said something about, what did he say? Something about, uh, if I got this right, Sean, that you thought it was a, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind of like, if the, if the, put, the, put more of the burden on the town if they want these sidewalks rather than on developers directly. I also agree with Bill uh, about where we 
stop when we make these demands that the sidewalks be built by developers. Uh, and I have a quick question for Charles. Uh, is it still true, uh, this is one thing I don't understand, is there still a liability of the property owner directly behind the sidewalk that they would still be responsible for general liability and for cleaning of that sidewalk wherever they're installed in town or in front of the Hubbard property building? I don't, um, I mean, there's sidewalks on public roads everywhere in town, um, and I, I don't know off the top of my head if the town has an ordinance requiring them to be shoveled during snow. Specifically, they, they, they do, and you get like 48 hours to clear it. Right, right, right. So, so I mean, it's, I, I, I would say it'd be no different than any other folks or, or sidewalk on uh, private property that's on a public way. Okay, so that becomes a burden on uh, the developer, all they are the owners of the building. They're already they're already plowing a lot. They're already clearing. It's not, you know, it, yeah, it's it's not in, in it's 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 fractional dollars. Okay, that's it. Uh, would you uh, like to look at the site plan? Uh, I, I just thought maybe we could pull up the site plan uh, and have a discussion about. Um, are you all seeing this? So. Yes. Thank you. So if you were, um, it meets the, the, the street there and there's like a little letter C. The letter C. Kind of, uh, C here? Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. So is there any issue with them maybe extending that up to the, to the road and creating a little you know, ADA pad where people could stand and wait for a bus or whatever? And then, you know, because you can see over here, if you look to the left, there's a fire hydrant. There's a, you know, a I mean, there's just, you know, it doesn't make sense to try to put it, from my perspective, to try to put a sidewalk on that side of the street if there's already a bridge to put a sidewalk on the other side. But at least extend that sidewalk on one side there so that it could get to the street without walking to the grass. And, and, and so, Bill, Bill, the way we are reading this is that that C, the little column there that runs north towards the road, is the only sidewalk. That's a light post, and that's not. It's a light. That's a light post, but if you look below the there, sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Bill. The side the sidewalk ends in the middle of the building when it turns into uh, their egress door. So Jamie's over it right now. That's where that sidewalk ends. Oh. Your plan. Okay. okay. Well, so that, that's that nice. the, the, the scene is a is a light post, and there's nothing above, nothing north of that um, egress door. Correct. And actually, Vic said it is a light post. Maybe it's better. You know, maybe this is something that you can work out with, you know, Janice and, and those folks as to which side you want to put it on. The other side doesn't have a light post, so I mean, it's actually a little bigger area. So maybe that would be the location. And then, Jamie, are, are you are you are, are you already part of those proposed meetings? Uh, no, no, we have not uh, scheduled a meeting other than just to say that. Uh, you know, an agreement that we could enter into discussions. Okay. Well, I can see that Attorney Bloom is on the line, so maybe, maybe you know, she's, you know, taking some notes and, you know, she can, I, I would love you to be in that meeting, too. I just think that that's important. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think the commission may want to continue along this discussion here. I mean, um, I don't think that we've discussed uh, uh, how the existing sidewalks uh, on the site uh, could potentially continue to the road, but I feel that this is a fruitful uh, conversation. Sure. I, I think, Jamie, the, the point of these deliberations here is to try to figure out if we have a, um, a condition that we feel comfortable that we can put on uh, as part of a approval. Um, and so I think the general question is, is how would that be worded? Um, do we feel, does the commission feel like we want to word it as it's a requirement, or do we want to word it as we would like them to discuss extending one of these sidewalks to the street and having a pad for um, ADA slash you know safety of, of residents? Um, so I I'd be a lot more comfortable. I I'd be a lot more comfortable as a, making this a requirement of the site that they bring the sidewalk out to the road. And if we want this pad, then we have the pad. I think that is a lot more reasonable uh, for us to require. 
then that they put this sidewalk in when we don't even know which side of the road the sidewalk is. I agree with Ted, and um, um, so, um, Shocker, if you're still on, can you address any uh, nuances that could involve the ADA? I, I think what we're talking about is the framing of a condition of approval, and, and we're going to have time between now and the next meeting to kind of, you know, to do that and maybe, you know, work with Janice and, and uh, yeah, maybe we could run it by the applicant. I, I don't know. Here it's okay. closed, but we'll worry about that. But certainly, yeah, yes. So let's Cert certainly, we're not experts in terms of how this runs through the road. I think everyone's in agreement that it seems like everyone's in agreement that that's something that we'd like to get uh, hammered out a little bit further, and certainly Jan would be the person to do that. Yep. Yeah. I think that addresses some of Phil's issues about safety. I think it does. I absolutely agree. Um, and I, I think this is kind of a, a, it's a nice middle ground because if in fact the town does install sidewalks on the other side of the street, then there's potentially a, a good crosswalk um, opportunity without the full burden of this um, larger sidewalk. And yeah, there, there's a potential you know, crosswalk up at Bullet Hill Road you know, crossing from at the intersection, north side of Hubbard Road to the south side of Hubbard Road, to right. go on the side of the road. This would be on the east side of Hubbard Road. So and that would create your loop. Yeah. Well, so, so, I, so, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Spence. Well, I, I mean, as I hear this, it seems to me that, that if we could get uh, the relevant engineers to, to think about this and, and frankly I, I didn't focus on the fact when I looked at this site plan that this existing sidewalk didn't go to the street but I think that's a mistake. Uh, if we can get the relevant engineers to come to some sort of an agreement with the developer on how the sidewalk would come to the street then I, I think that's as far as we can go in this issue of the sidewalk, whether it's on the north side or the south side. When the town decides to build the sidewalk, then I think that that's the time to, to figure this other sidewalk issue out. Thanks. Um, did anyone else have any other items that they wanted to deliberate about? Um, you know, uh, items for approval? Yes, Mr. Johnson. So the, the one thing that hits me is, is pretty odd. So there are 50 units in each building, and it's a four-story building. So I'm, su I'm assuming there's either 12 or 13 units on each floor. And there is one elevator. We don't have any idea what the capacity of the elevator is. And they're asking people to walk 250 feet to the dumpster to put away their trash. I mean, is that? I mean, there's no like trap. I mean, in, in most larger, you know, residential buildings, there's either a trash chute or something of that nature, where people can dispose of their. I mean, no, are we going to ask people to take their trash into the elevator, go down, walk across the parking lot? I mean, has that been fully contemplated as a health and safety issue? Amy, do you want to speak to that? I know we discussed that briefly. Sure. Uh, the only sort of follow-up I did on, on that topic was I reached out to the Guilford Housing Authority and their uh, director, uh, Ms. Terry Revisa, and asked her uh, how they managed uh, waste uh, uh, on site. And uh, that is uh, housing for seniors as well. And they uh, each uh, resident is responsible for taking out uh, their own waste to the dumpsters. Um, but, but to the best of my knowledge, we don't have any 50-unit buildings that are four stories tall with one elevator servicing the entire building in town. Unless I'm incorrect on that, right? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think it's obvious. <laughs> Okay, I, I mean, I don't mean to phrase it like that, but like, yeah, right. I mean, if, if, so, if, 
Tell them I understand your concern, but is, do you have a suggestion for what we would uh, take? I guess my question is whether or not there, there is a, a potential request to either you know, have an internal garbage chute and collection that would facilitate a more appropriate collection of residents' garbage as opposed to, I mean, we don't know. These are 51 bedroom units, so we don't know what the, the and at least part of the commitment on this project is for senior housing. And we're going to be asking people to lug their garbage across the parking lot, potentially I mean, down. I mean, in, all, in all seasons. It just, that hits me as, as a flaw, a, a design flaw that maybe we, I don't know if that's within our purview to ask if that's a health issue or not. I don't know. Obviously, Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously it's not something that our regulations currently even remotely contemplate. Um, well, we did, we did, we did discuss, you know, the management of um, trash, dumpster versus individual containers on, at Eagle View. Okay. So we, you know, it did come up. Right. Uh, it came up because they were proposing they have individual ones, and, and we were, you know, there was, you know, it was more of a question about which way it was better. And I think, right, in case Phil, you thought the individual one, based on your experience with rentals, was a better choice. But I think to Scott's point, we probably really don't have the uh, authority or, or, you know, ability I'm to not, question. I, I, did, I just bring it up as a long term potential problem of, you know, if you have individuals that might be less able than others, and you're on the third or the fourth floor of a building, and there are 50 other people, and you've got to bring your garbage out, and you wait for the other, are, are you just going to leave it in the hall? I, I, again, I, we're yeah. trying to like make this work as, as, as well as possible, as opposed to, and, and trying to... Uh, so, uh, I, I, I think that that's the point. We, we want to make this work. Yeah. I, I, know, I agree. I think we're getting kind of off topic here. Like, okay, we're, okay, a land, okay. we're a land commission. We have to see where the dumpster is located on the property, and I, I don't think we should be dictating how they manage the, the garbage getting to that dumpster. I, I think we're a little off topic. And I love you, Phil. <laughs> I mean, right, right. We can, certainly we can have some, certainly something we can have a committee look into is first. I mean. You're not going to get it done after the fact. So, I don't disagree. You can't make that a condition of approval this day. I'm just, I, I'm, just asking, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking logistically if it makes sense to have 50 units hauling their garbage by hand down one elevator to a dumpster that's 250 feet away. So, I, uh, so Phil, I. I agree. I build apartment buildings for a living, and we don't put any of we we put a trash chute in every single one of them. But that's also the New Haven specifically. But I think it, it's hard because again, we don't have any regulation that that we can lean on, and even suggesting putting a trash chute is pretty cost prohibitive. Um, yeah, I'm just again, I'm just you asked for any other concerns, and that was sure. And I'm sure that that's uh, Andy Bloom's online show mentioned it, so maybe maybe your vision will come through, but I just think that Frank's right, we need to sort of push your company. Hopefully, Amy. Sorry. Um, any other commissioners had any other items that they thought we should deliver as, as the term of approval? Um, Jamie, was there anything else on your list that we needed to discuss? Yes, thank you, Scott. Um, two things that I wanted to uh, discuss. One is the, um, it actually came as a recommendation from the uh, Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Commission. It involved um, the uh, filing written maintenance and operation manual for the geometrics, geometric soil air system uh, uh, maintenance and inspections to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I, I would like the, uh, Commission to just uh, consider that um, you know inspections, uh, maintenance, uh, regulation, and administration of septic systems in the town is the purview of the local health department. 
Um, I have had a, a, a conversation with the director of our health department uh, regarding this recommendation, and uh, she feels that it uh, should be the local health department and not the Planning and Zoning Commission. So I just, just wanted to get your feedback on that. Uh, additionally uh, to that one, uh, the uh, housing affordability plan that was submitted as part of this application has a small uh, section that describes the administrator of the affordability. Um, this is basically uh, the applicant had proposed that it be the Guilford Housing Authority be the administrator. And what that means is that the housing authority would become the entity that does uh, you know, the marketing and the review of the financial qualifications of applicants for the affordable units. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we had initially kind of facilitated a discussion between the Guilford Housing Authority and the applicant. Um, and I believe they're having a meeting, uh, both parties, the end of this month. Uh, but that may be something that you would want to consider as a, as a condition as well, is that, um, you know, we look at that language and we either, um, you know, require that, I don't know, Chuck, help me out here, but, you know, require that it be the Guilford Housing Authority or that a future administrator be approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission or something um, like that. Sir, does, the, does, the, does the Guilford Housing Authority receive any compensation for its involvement in Yes, they are meant to, and that's part of the conversation that needs to happen is the details of what would be required. Um, you know, and I think, but, and I'll just take this a point further, sorry. Um, as we, uh, the Board of Select People just voted to adopt our affordable housing plan, and part of that strategy long term is as we begin to build our inventory and our stock of affordable housing, that we have uh, kind of a, a, a known partner or perhaps one or two partners uh, that are, are uh, well experienced in affordable housing to administer all of the, administer the affordability of all of those units. Um, and, and we have had discussions with the Guilford Housing Authority as well as uh, NeighborWorks New Horizons to serve in that role. So just something to think about. Diversifying our administrators as opposed to putting most of our eggs in one basket? Uh, I'll give you my, the, the issue you're concerned about for the affordability stuff is that it, it's great that you have affordable housing, but you really want to, you want the people that it's targeted for to actually inhabit it. So what you want, and that involves you know, income qualifications, people providing income tax returns and what are certifying that they really are of a certain income and not higher, they're not cheating, they're not getting in where the poor needy person is left out. It's a fairly meticulous process, so you want somebody who has experience doing it. Because frankly, the developer himself doesn't really care. You know, they just want the things occupied, whatever, they don't really care. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, they care. But I'm, I'm just saying, they, they, they don't have as, as much incentive if it's somebody who's trained, who's done this, and other sites, or whatever, and in there, so good for them. They're saying, hey, the housing authority, or the, uh, they do this all the time, and so they know what to look for, and, and so they, you know, they know what to ask for, so let's get them. So the point is, what if they don't agree, and they'd be paid for them? So that's great, too. The point is that you want somebody qualified who's going to do that, who's going to put the time in to make sure you're getting the right applicants. So what the, I think, what, uh, Jamie's suggesting is that and in the event that the Housing Authority, the Cambridge Agreement Housing Authority, that the Commission have the right to approve whoever is coming up. So they say, oh, we couldn't get with the Housing Authority, they come and say, we propose so-and-so, and then you get the chance to say, okay, what's their qualifications? Do they have experience doing this? Sounds great, you can do it. So that, I think that's, that was Jamie's point. But, do, but, do, but does our Housing Authority have the capacity they can say no if they don't, but I understand. No, 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 no. Do they have the capacity? Do they have the head count? Do they have the, you know, oh, the, the, the personnel? Um, I, I don't know. 
I I I I mean I mean they they don't feel qualified to do it they feel that they're understaffed they have enough to do what they're doing then they say no in which case then that's why we want to because right now the plan just reads its thousand authority so that's why we want to put some notes in and admit that that doesn't work out then you guys have the authority to uh, to approve it you know at some point it makes sense to have a fallback or have you know a secondary source yeah, it would be great to options mm -hmm. right and that and that's what we would say that if that doesn't work then you come in but I, I think they have some credibility if they can't do it they're understaffed whatever but you, you do want someone with the experience and they and they're the locals that do it right yeah it seems seems like we're in agreement that we would like some language like that as a term to, to the question of the maintenance of the air and train system Jamie, it is that by putting it over into the uh, health area that makes it sort of evergreen right it doesn't have any you know, it goes on for as long as there's a health department, correct? Yeah, I mean, my, um, you know, I'm always very cautious of uh, stepping on uh, areas of other departments' jurisdiction, uh, and the, the health department is, you know, the kind of full stop uh, on, on septic systems, uh, and, and per the, the regulations that, that govern their work, I mean, they, uh, you know, if, if something was wrong with the system, they would be allowed to go on site, uh, you know, automatically as of right. So I just feel that it's uh, better served. Bill, your, Bill, your question, uh, the, the, the point of us putting it in as a term of our condition, that's what makes it evergreen, actually. And then she's just asking if we should direct it to the correct, you know, to what it should be the health department as opposed to the planning and zoning. Yeah, I think the quarterly reporting, I mean, I'm, I've been involved in two different towns with those systems, and they go to the health department, not planning zone. Right. Although they work yeah. in the engines of the planning zone. So. Okay. Because yeah. I think that uh, Kevin Clark said something about the reason they didn't want it in wetlands is it, it, it eventually wasn't under anyone's control, is that correct? Correct. That's why the plan is now to determine of our condition. Correct. Right. Perfect. Great. Um, Okay, any, anything else that we feel we should deliberate? Uh, it seems like we got a lot of work for, uh, for just, our team. <laughs> just one more, sorry. Uh, I just sure. want to ensure that uh, everyone understands and is comfortable with uh, the land dedication that is proposed. Uh, so the land dedication is about, I think it's 17,000 in square feet and change adjacent to the uh, West River, and then also uh, um, Kevin described, Kevin McGee described it in his memo for last meeting, a, 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 a continued parcel of dedication that would get any members of the public that are enjoying the West River up and around the guardrail of the bridge there. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jamie. And again, uh, just to remind the commission, where this is being brought up because it, it's the inter you know, Jamie's interpretation of, of our regs that this, we're the ones that decide. Um, and so that's why she's asking the question. I, for one, am, am you know, in favor of it. We've heard from the town that they're happy with it. We're, we've heard from um, Kevin McGee that we're happy with it. So um, it seems like general consensus that we are. Right. And then maybe we'll tie into that second one. So. <laughs> that's, that's right. But we'll bring that back up. But yeah. just one more, uh, one more piece of that, and Chuck, perhaps you can help me with this. Uh, the land that they're proposing to dedicate does exceed a certain percentage of land that is considered an inland wetland or a watercourse, uh, and so that can be, uh, you know, waived or over. I don't know what the term is, but by a three-quarter vote of the commission. So, Chuck, maybe so just. So part of our approval would have to require. Right. I, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, they don't have to comply with the regulation. <laughs> you can approve without that. Oh, okay. <laughs> remember, this use is in a lot of the zones, industrial zones. I mean, we don't right. but, but we're approving the thing anyway. But, but that said, if, you know, let's right. get as close as we can so we can win. Right. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anything else, Jamie? No, that's it. Thank you. I make a motion to continue to this discussion uh, to our meeting of June 1. 
I'll second. Uh, was all in favor say aye? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Um, all right. Regular meeting will continue. Uh, we have a pending application with uh, Anthony and Danielle Papakota. Uh, new applications. Brian uh, Mareska, two, 281 Church Street, uh, 53, Lot 13, Zone R1, the permit for a 864 square foot detached garage. Received and sent public hearing for June 1st, 2021. Um, Julie Fowler, 2545 Long Hill Road, Map 105, Lot 3, Zone R8, request for a two lot subdivision. Uh, we're receiving uh, and then referring Jamie to uh, and then by lens, is that correct? Correct. Process. Um, Linda Toscano, uh, 69 Boston Street, Map 40, uh, 47 Zone R3, special permit for day program for adults and with disabilities. Uh, received and set public hearing for June 1st, 2021. Uh, Mirza Akhtar, uh, 72 Stepstone Hill Road, Map 91, Lot 30, C4. Zone R5, special permit for a one bedroom, 772 square foot after the fact accessory apartment. Receive and set public hearing for June 15, 2022. Um, South Lane Bistro, Red Shares LLC, 63 Woodfield Street, about 39, lot 94, zone C1. Site plan revision for seasonal dining area to create a bird lot and for some improvements to the house, kitchen, and support area. Um, that's just to receive as well as uh, Strawberry Hill Reserve, 222 and 220, 2240 uh, Boston Bus Road, map 78, lots 10 and 11, so MU slash C2. Uh, site plans for a lot line modification and the construction of a 48 unit multifamily residential development. Uh, that's also received. Do I hear a motion for the four items um, that were setting public hearing for? Um, so, um, so, uh, so Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, motion carries. Um, Jamie, do we have any correspondence to review? Uh, we do have a, a request or perhaps just a reminder. Um, the uh, town is redoing their website. Uh, very exciting. And uh, we are taking steps to um, also enhance the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission as well as Planning and Zoning Department website. Uh, and uh, also in tandem with this is that we have new commissioners. So we wanted to just uh, reiterate and perhaps Lisa will be following up with all of you to collect your information. But the section that lists uh, all, of, all of your names and affiliations, uh, it does also list your address uh, it lists an email, as well as, for some of you, a telephone number. Uh, the telephone number is not required, um, so I just wanted to kind of put out there that Lisa will be reaching out to, you know, update that section of our website and seeking information from you. Um, it is not a requirement to have your telephone number uh, if you don't, do not wish to have it. Uh, I, had, I had a telephone call over the weekend. From some questioning and activity on near my property. Yeah, sorry about that, Sean. I couldn't help myself. I thought it was a prank call, but trying to be polite. But, you know, Frank, you didn't disguise your voice for that call. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to the minutes from our main fourth meeting. Um, has anyone had a chance to review those minutes? I did review those minutes and they seem substantially correct in my eyes. Anyone would like to make a motion of approval? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Please Aye. Stand. All opposed? All stand. 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 Uh, all right, so. Abstention. That means we have four yeses, uh, three yeses and four abstentions. Uh, Okay. Okay. No, there's no one against it, so... There's no one against it, so the motion carries. Um, okay, Jamie, do we have any other items for the regular meeting? Uh, we no, we do not. No, we do not. Okay, one thing I would note is we do 
are, are we trying to schedule a special meeting, Jamie? Um, we're going to have a, work, a, working a work session? workshop mm -hmm. on the 26th. The 26th. 26th. Yep. And can yeah. you just send out a memo on that? I will. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, with also the updated uh, regs, I can do that as well. So I'd ask, uh, will, will, uh, will Glenn be at the meeting or not? He will not. Okay. Uh, if it's if, the one we did last month. Yeah. Um, so again, I would ask that all commissioners please hang out here on the line. Um, we have an executive session following this, but let's, um, Jamie, should we move to sending all, all public um, right. the meeting? I mean, I think, Chuck, if you could advise, uh, my approach here was going to be uh, ask Peter to stop recording. Uh, I would turn off the recording and ask uh, Eric to leave the room. Um, is that is that how we proceed here? Uh, and probably Brendan also. And Brandon. Brendan. Right. What what you, when we go in executive session, yes, yeah. we, we want to exclude the public. And so how we do that technically, I'm not sure. Obviously in the room you need to exclude the public. And then you need to indicate the purpose, which is to discuss pending litigation, particularly the demand versus planning and zoning commission case. And then you indicate who is come, who you invited in, uh, and I think uh, like you would, you would invite me as, as your attorney, Jamie okay. as, as uh, staff, and I don't know, uh, I don't know if Lisa needs to come in. Uh, it's up to you. But and then I think I think Mr. Freeman, you could recuse yourself from this matter, so you wouldn't participate in this. And uh, but I think you know all, all other uh, commission members and alternates. And there are no minutes, right? No, right, correct, correct. No minutes other than right. we, we indicate what time we went in and when we come out, but otherwise. Okay, and, and, and so uh, the, I'm not sure, it's the administrator or moderator. I'm not, I should know, but I'm not sure if Brendan probably is, but um, it does the moderator. We should. Can they, I, can, can I can, I can, uh, uh, I think I can. Brendan, Brendan, I'm, I'm going to remove you from our Zoom room. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Well, as a person who's recused in the past, I was able to listen in and say something that's different in this particular case. Yes, I, yeah, for pending litigation, uh, yes, I, I think you heard the application, obviously, and it was the application for the pending litigation. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to go 